All right, greetings everyone. Today we're going to look a little bit at the anatomy and physiology as it relates to electrocardiography, the EKG, finally the best part of the course. All right, so let's start off with, uh, with a few things. So we're going to talk about anatomy first, important for us to see how things are laid out. And specifically, we're going to look at the vessels of the heart, so the cardiac arteries specifically. We're not going to worry so much about veins. We're going to look at the valves of the heart. And last but not least, we'll look at conduction system anatomy. So we're going to do a couple things here. We're going to look at the blood vessels uh, that are directly related to the cardiac arteries. We're going to look at cardiac valves and then the conduction system. All right, so I'm going to draw a bunch of crude drawings here, and that's about the extent of things that you need to know as well. So don't get too excited by the drawings. So I'm going to draw a box heart for now, and we're going to simply use this as our heart. This is going to be the best that I can do with, uh, with the heart here. So we're going to first look at the vessels of the heart. So let's draw our heart, and let's assign a couple things here. So this is the patient's right side making this their left, making this the top, making this the bottom. Important for us to orient ourselves here since I'm not drawing a, a, uh, a true graphic representation of what the heart looks like. All right, so as you know, as with every other organ and tissue in the body pretty much, with, the, with a few exceptions, um, the heart is no different in terms of its need for oxygen and fuel, whether it's glucose or, uh, or other nutrients. And then, of course, all of the ions that are important to the heart. So sodium, calcium, potassium being some big ones there. And then if uh, glucose, of course, it needs to, uh, to do a couple things with. So the heart has to have a pretty intricate mechanism by which it moves blood uh, to the organ itself and it perfuses the organ. And then, of course, it's got to have veins on the other end. So those are the arteries we're talking about that actually get blood from the heart. Uh, from the chambers of the heart, so to speak, back out to the heart itself, to the actual organ, so it can be perfused. And then the venous system, the cardiac venous system, we're not going to really talk much about it because in, for our purposes, it has little value. Um, so instead of confusing things, we're just going to leave it with the vessels, specifically the arteries. All right, so at the top of the heart, right, and again, this is, not, um, this is not true in terms of what this all looks like, uh, the heart doesn't look anything like this, but at the top of the heart we have the big main artery, the aorta, and I'll abbreviate that like you'll see in most textbooks as capital A, little o. So this is the aorta, and the aorta is the vessel by which oxygenated blood uh, travels from the left ventricle, this is the left ventricle here, travels from the left ventricle out the aorta to the rest of the body, so to all of our different parts. And so this is a high pressure system. And off of the aorta, two vessels come off of that. And these are going to be important vessels because these are the vessels that are going to perfuse the heart itself. So on one side of the aorta, we're going to have a vessel that comes off on the left-hand side here. And we have a separate vessel that comes off of the right-hand side here. So I'm going to just kind of draw a cursory vessel for now. And then we're going to label its little parts here and see where they all go. So... Let's take a look at the first branch here. This first branch in red is called the right coronary artery. All right, so this is the big guy that branches off the aorta, off to the right side, and it is abbreviated the RCA for right coronary artery. And the right coronary artery is one of only two branches off the aorta that's responsible for perfusing the myocardium with oxygenated blood and all those nutrients we talked a little bit about just a few moments ago. So you may be asking yourself, first of all, what relevance is knowing the intricacies of all of these arteries that supply blood to the heart? And the answer is this, because not only are we going to be able to, in a few days or in a few weeks, actually look at the EKG and predict which of these vessels is occluded in some cases, meaning that there's a plug in it, it could be a plaque plug or it could be a thrombus formation, uh, could be platelet formation, could be all sorts of different things, could be fat, could be bone. In any case, there can be something that resides in one of these coronary vessels, and that means that all of the tissue that's not receiving oxygenated blood because there's an obstruction in one of these vessels is going to become ischemic, 
and myocardial ischemia has very specific presentation on the EKG, which we'll all be able to recognize in the next few weeks. So the importance of understanding the anatomy and the layout is because it has some, uh, we'll have the ability to predict which vessel it is. And based on our prediction, we'll also be able to detect or to predict certain events that may take place while the patient with an ischemic heart is in our care. So for example, in some regions of the heart, we'll anticipate VFib and VTAC more often than in other regions of the heart that's ischemic. So it's important for us to have this foundation for the anatomy because it's going to allow us to do a lot of things when we put it together with a diagnostic tool or with a certain patient presentation. So again, when there are plugs in one or more of these vessels, sometimes the patient has a very specific presentation uh, associated with that. And so it's important for us to understand which piece of the myocardium is failing and why we see some of the signs and symptoms that we see. All right, so off the right coronary artery, one of the things that I want you to be familiar with is I want you to be familiar with a branch that comes off of the right coronary artery, and we're going to call it the sinoatrial whoops, yep, sinoatrial node artery. The sinoatrial node is also known as the SA node, so we can call this the SA nodal artery. Either one is acceptable. So I want you to know this, and I also want you to know that in approximately 50% of the population, the right coronary artery is the one who supplies or who has this additional branch called the SA nodal artery, which means that in the other half of us, the SA nodal artery originates from a different vessel, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. All right, also off the right coronary artery, there is another branch, and that branch is called the atrioventricular ventricular node artery and we can abbreviate this AV nodal artery. They mean the same thing. And in 90% of the population, 90% of people, the AV nodal artery branches off the right coronary artery. So these are important numbers for us to grasp now because soon we're going to associate a, a picture. We're going to be able to see what happens when the AV node is blocked. We're going to be able to see when the right coronary artery is blocked above the level of the AV node. That's going to cause us very specific findings on the EKG. So right coronary artery, so far two branches. One branch goes off to the SA node, one branch goes off to the AV node, and the importance of those is that we're going to be able to see specific EKG changes. All right, so right coronary artery also feeds the right ventricle, and by feeding I mean it perfuses that area with oxygenated blood and glucose and all the other nutrients. And it also supplies a portion of the inferior or the bottom wall of the left ventricle. So this is kind of an important artery. So this artery, not only does it supply oxygenated blood to the SA node and the AV node, which we haven't talked about yet, but those are both important pieces of the conduction system. We'll get to those in the next video. But it also supplies the entire right ventricle, and it, it also supplies oxygenated blood to the inferior wall of the left ventricle. So really, really, really important artery. Also, this artery can sometimes supply the low left lateral ventricular wall. So that is to say that this artery can extend a little bit beyond the inferior, the bottom portion of the heart, and it can kind of extend beyond that all the way up to this, this area here where we have the lateral, the side ventricular wall of the left ventricle also supplied by the RCA. All right, so let's switch gears now a little bit. Let's take a look at if the left side, I mean, boy, the right side pretty much covers everything. So the left side branches off, and it branches off for a short little bit, only for about one inch. And that little one inch is called the left main coronary artery. And it is abbreviated left main, sometimes you'll see it LMCA, sometimes you'll see it the left main artery. Either one is acceptable. 
So when you're starting to read stuff and you in the literature, you'll just have to see what the the context of these abbreviations is. Uh, but for the most part, either one is acceptable, and you'll see both of those. So left main coronary artery is the branch that comes off of the aorta. It's the second of two main coronary vessels, and it's only about an inch long before it quickly subdivides into two additional places. And one of those is going to be this artery that comes to the front of the heart, and this is known as the left anterior descending and hopefully now you're going to make sense that if this is coming off the left, it's coming to the front, and it's going down the front. So the left anterior descending, this is also known as the LAD, and it is also referred to as the widow maker. So we're going to see some very specific changes associated with the widow maker um, in, uh, in a few days here when we finally get around to um, to looking at what the EKG looks like. All right, so this is the widow maker. This is the left anterior descending is the LAD. Important to memorize that. And this supplies the anterior wall of the left ventricle, essentially. So that's the important piece you need to remember. Anterior wall of left ventricle. All right, cool. And then we said it divides into two. The left main coronary artery does. So there's this other branch that comes off here, and it kind of goes around to the side and to the back. And this is called the left circumflex artery. You'll hear this called the circ or the circumflex a lot. There is no right circumflex, so saying circumflex is okay because we know there's not one on the right-hand side. So you'll sometimes see this abbreviated as LCX. This is the left circumflex. All right, so... Uh, left circumflex, this uh, s provides some oxygenated blood to the top or the superior portion of the lateral side, uh, of the left lateral side of the heart. So circumflex artery is important because it kind of takes care of the top portions of the heart and the left side of the heart. The left anterior descending takes care of the front side of the left portion of the heart. And then the right coronary artery kind of takes care of everything else. So there's one additional artery that I'm just going to mention, and I'm going to write it over here, and it's going to be called the posterior descending artery. And it is abbreviated the PDA. And these things are going to be confusing at some point because in cardiology, we also have another thing, PDA. It's called the patent ductus arteri arteriosus. So important, again, to understand what the context is and to, uh, to be careful when you're reading to make sure that, you're, you're, that the abbreviations are right. So the posterior descending artery actually can arise either from the right coronary or from the left coronary. It can come from either side. And so I'm just going to leave it out, and I'm going to say... It supplies the backside, the posterior wall of the left ventricle, and it can originate either from the right or the left side, and its main function in life is exactly opposite of the LAD. Instead of going to the front of the heart, it is supplying oxygenated blood to the rear or to the back of the heart. All right, so I think that's pretty much all you need to know for the vessels. It may seem like a lot, but I think that's a, that's a good place. All right, so let's move on forward a little bit, and let's now take a look at some additional features. So we're going to, again, draw our heart here, and we're going to talk a little bit about the heart valves. And it's important for you to understand where the heart valves are and what their names are, because you're going to actually be able to hear valve problems in some patients very, very clearly in those with advanced valvular disease. And you're going to be able to hear them with a stethoscope. Sometimes you don't even need a stethoscope to hear it. Also, um, even though it's kind of a lost art to listen to, lung, to uh, heart sounds in, the, in, in any setting for the, that matter because we have other tests that are also non-invasive and that have uh, a higher sensitivity and specificity for determining the level of problem. In fact, we can actually see if there's regurgitation or if there's valvular disease or if there's a growth on the valve. Or, or if the valves are calcified, all sorts of different things we can, we can do. But unfortunately, in the pre-hospital setting, what we have for, for our purposes is, uh, is going to be the stethoscope and then to figure out 
based on what the patient's present, uh, presenting problem, whether or not there might be a valve that's at stake here. All right, so I'm going to label the chambers. This is a heart. This is the right atrium. So this is the left atrium. This is the right ventricle. This is the left ventricle. And we're going to say that between the atria and the ventricles, so between the right atrium and the right ventricle, there's going to be a valve that exists here. And between the left atrium and left ventricle, also a valve here. And these valves in red are, also, are going to be called the AV valves. So we have the right AV valve. Whoops. We have the right AV valve. Give me one second to fix that. My eraser is very small. Right AV valve. And we have the left AV valve. So that's one way of naming these things, if you can't remember the actual names. But I'm going to give you the actual names because I'd like you to know them. So in between the right atrium and the right ventricle, there is a valve, and it is called the tricuspid valve, meaning that it has three leaflets, or three cusps. On the left side of the heart, we have the mitral valve, or the bicuspid valve, that exists between the left atrium and left ventricle. So saying that there's a left AV valve problem, a mitral valve problem, a bicuspid valve problem, those are all synonymous. Saying that there's a tricuspid valve problem or a right AV valve problem, again, those two terms also synonymous. All right, so let's take a look at the other two possibilities here. And just for the sake of demonstration here, I'm going to draw a valve here, even though there is no valve on the side of the right ventricle. And there is no valve on the side of the left ventricle either. They come out of their uh, kind of out of the top and the, the sides to the rear. Um, but I don't have the ability to draw that here because I suck at drawing. So let's take a look at these valves that I've drawn in here. These do not represent their actual location, but rather just, uh, just for discussion's sake, I'm going to put them there. So the right side of the heart receives deoxygenated blood from the, the, from the entire body. It goes into the right atrium. It traverses through the tricuspid valve. And once it reaches the level of the right ventricle, the right ventricle squeezes and it closes the right AV valve, and in doing so, it builds pressure in there, and oxi uh, deoxygenated blood travels through this valve right here, out of the right ventricle, into the pulmonary arteries. So the pulmonary arteries are the vessels that carry deoxygenated blood from right ventricle to the lungs, and in order to get into the pulmonary arteries, they have to go through this valve. And this valve is called the pulmonary semilunar. Semilunar. And it's called semilunar because it kind of looks like a half moon. All right, if you were to look kind of down on that, those valves, this is the valve as you're looking down on it. Those valve leaflets kind of, kind of take place like that. That's not a very good drawing. But these two leaflets... They kind of come together in a semilunar fashion. All right, so then on the other side, the left ventricle, the left ventricle exhausts or exits out the aorta and goes to the body. And in doing so, it has to go through this, uh, this other valve, and that valve is called the aortic semilunar valve. All right, and now we've kind of taken a look at all the valves here. So between the atria and the ventricles, we have the AV valves, or the names respectively, and Coming out of the right ventricle, we have the pulmonary semilunar. That's the, uh, that's the other end of the right ventricle. And left ventricle is the aortic semilunar. So kind of an important concept here, and I'm going to go to a new page to illustrate this. I want you to appreciate the fact that the aorta is kind of this really cool thing. So the aorta has this root, and I'm going to try to draw this here as best as I can. This is the root of the aorta. And if you want to picture that, that this, uh, this is the left ventricle that kind of sits, sits something like this on the side here. All right, so this is kind of what the left ventricle does. It kind of sits on its side. It's not really up and down like you see in a lot of textbooks. And these little round areas here are actually the leaflets to the aortic semilunar valve. Whoops. They are the leaflets to the aortic semilunar valve. So these guys here are these little leaflets, all right? These are the little leaflets to the aortic semilunar 
And so this is the valve that's right in this area here. And of course, this is the aorta that goes off and goes to the rest of the body and branches off. So when you look at these little aortic semilunar valves, I want you to think about something that they can do for us here. Because if you think about when the body gets oxygenated blood, normally the body gets blood, meaning that that body gets blood when the left ventricle is contracting. So when the left ventricle contracts, when it squeezes, it forces these leaflets open. It allows oxygenated blood to travel out the aorta and into the different areas of the body. But if you can imagine what happens to the heart, the heart, when it's squeezing, it gets, it changes the wall size of the, of the chambers because they're squeezing. If you think about having your hand open uh, or, or uh, grabbing a ball or something like that, a big basketball, and now you take your hand and you make a closed fist, a really, really tight closed fist, you'll see that the surface of your skin gets really, really stretched when it's, when it's flexed, when you're making a fist. Well, the same thing happens to the outside walls of the heart when it's contracting. And so this neat little adaptation exists so that the heart can actually get oxygenated blood when it's not all contracted and when it's not all firm on the outside. So the blood that gets to the body actually happens when the ventricle is contracting, but the heart gets its oxygenated blood during ventricular diastole. So ventricular systole is contraction, ventricular diastole, I think about diastolic blood pressure that happens when it's at rest. During ventricular diastole, when the, the, the left ventricle is at rest, and when these little leaflets are closed, this is where the right coronary artery originates, this is where the left main coronary artery originates, and so the heart actually gets its oxygenated blood as a passive movement of blood from pressure that exists as a leftover pressure from the aorta after the heart has stopped contracting. And blood passively enters into these two vessels, the right and the left main coronary arteries, by way of this passive motion during ventricular diastole. So another important concept for you to remember. All right, let's move on to the conduction system, and we'll take a little break. So conduction system is actually pretty quite simple. So I'm not going to draw uh, each and every single piece uh, of the heart here. What I'm actually going to do in isolation is I'm just going to say this is the line that represents everything above it is going to be atrial tissue. Everything below it is going to be ventricular tissue. And I'm just going to draw this little line here to indicate that everything to the right of this line is actually the left side of the patient. Everything to the left, as we're looking at it, is actually the right side of the patient. All right, so here we have the two atria. Here we have the two ventricles. Now let's take a look at the conduction system components. So the first conduction system component that you need to be familiar with is called the sinoatrial node and we abbreviate this the SA node. And the SA node is the primary pacemaker of the heart. It has the ability to inherently fire a certain number of times per minute and it is and it's responsible for pacing the rate at which the heart beats. And there are things that influence the overall rate of the SA node and we'll get to those in a little bit. But for now what I want you to remember is that in the top right hand corner in the back portion of the heart. So think about top, back, right. That's where the SA node lies. So it lies in this superior, posterior, right side, right atrial uh, portion of the heart. And it is designed to beat in adults 60 to 100 times per minute. That's how many times it's going to initiate a trigger for the heart to respond to and ultimately contract. So as you know, we, um, we have two atria. And in order for the SA node to conduct its mechanism or its, its trigger all the way to the left side, there is another piece of the conduction system. And this next piece of the conduction system is called the interatrial 
tract and it has a specific name it's called Bachman's bundle and Bachman's bundle is nothing more than a piece of the conduction system that takes the impulse created at the level of the SA node over to the left atrium so that the right atrium and the left atrium can essentially depolarize and then contract at uh, a near simultaneous moment. All right, so next thing we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about this little guy that sits right in the bottom left-hand corner of the right atrium, and his name is the AV node. And the AV node is a gatekeeper of sorts. It's going to take electrical impulses that it receives from the SA node and it's going to hang on to it for a little while. It acts as a capacitor. It acts as a delay mechanism giving the ventricles enough time to completely fill with blood. So remember even though we're looking at the electrical component here what's really happening is when the SA node depolarizes it causes all of the atrial tissue to contract. When atrial tissue contracts, it forces blood from the right atrium down to the right ventricle, and it also causes the left atrium to depolarize and contract, causing blood to go from the left atrium to the left ventricle. Well, we've worked so hard to make this body of ours efficient, and in doing so, what we want to do is make every single contraction of the heart count for as much as it can. So what happens is, if we get this depolarization that takes place, this trigger that takes place, and it travels down to the AV node, if the AV node allowed that message to immediately go down to the ventricles, the ventricles would contract right away, and they may only be half full of blood. So that would be an inefficient system. So instead what we have is this gatekeeper of the AV node. AV node hangs on to the, to the electrical signal for just a little bit of time, allowing the ventricles to completely fill with blood, and then it releases the signal. So the AV node is responsible for taking the signal that it receives from the SA node and hanging on to it. I call it the gatekeeper. It acts as a gatekeeper between atrial tissue and ventricular tissue. All right, so right around the AV node, I'm just going to put some little green stuff here, and I'm going to say that right around the AV node, there's this thing called the AV junction. And the AV junction is the atrioventricular junction. And the AV junction is known as the secondary pacemaker of the heart. And the AV junction, just like the SA node, also has an intrinsic firing rate. And that intrinsic firing rate is 40 to 60 times per minute in adults. So think about this as a backup mechanism. Think about this as a mechanism for survival. And if the SA node fails, we got to have a backup system, and our backup system is the AV junction, and the AV junction is set to fire 40 to 60 times per minute. So it's really important to understand this concept that if you look at the inherent firing rate, the, the underlying rate, the natural speed of the SA node, it is significantly higher than the inherent firing rate of the AV junction, and there's a reason for that because the heart muscle is going to respond to the pacemaker that is the fastest. So if the SA node and the AV junction were both set to fire at the same rate, then they would constantly be competing with one another for the primary pacemaker responsibility. And we don't want that. So instead what happens is the SA node is responsible for firing the fastest, so it's the primary pacemaker. If this fails and if the rate of the SA node drops below the inherent firing rate of the AV junction, then the AV junction simply takes over. So that is to say, if the SA node becomes hypoxic, if it gets sick, if it's damaged, if it's traumatized physically, or if there's some reason that it cannot function anymore at a rate of 60 to 100, and the SA node starts to fire only 40 beats per minute, the AV junction is going to pick up and assume the primary pacemaking capability of the heart. So pretty neat mechanism, pretty neat backup system. So if you haven't asked yourself yet, you should ask yourself, how does the electrical information that originates in the SA node get to the AV node in the first place? Answer is, there are three tracks, 
And these three tracks are called internodal pathways. And you don't need to know the names of these pathways, but they all have a name. This is Bachman's. This is Wunkybach's. And this is Thorell's track. And you don't need to know those. What you do need to know is that there are three internodal pathways that represent a mechanism for taking an electrical impulse, making sure that the entire atrium gets that signal, and for delivering that signal down to the level of the AV node, who is then going to hang on to that signal for a prescribed period of time and then release it down to the ventricles. All right, so, so far lots of information, but all we've talked about is tissue that originates, that's, uh, that's conduction system tissue, that originates in or near atrial tissue. All right, we haven't talked about anything ventricular yet. All right, so let's move forward. So once the AV node does release that signal, it releases that signal through a piece of the conduction system called the bundle of Hiss, or the Hiss bundle. And the Hiss bundle is the only piece of connective, or I don't mean connective, I mean conductive tissue. It's the only piece of tissue that communicates any activity between the atrial side of things and the ventricular side of things. And that's really important. We're going to talk about muscle contraction in a little while. I'm sure you've read about it, that it's an all or none phenomenon. What that means is that if you reach the amount of threshold, if you reach the potential for depolarizing muscle tissue, if one cell depolarizes, all of the cells depolarize. Well, we don't want that in the heart. We want all of the atrial cells to depolarize at the same time, but we don't want the ventricular cells to do so as well. So what exists between the atrial and ventricular tissue is this sheath of connective tissue that does not conduct electrical information. So the only way to communicate electrical information from atrial tissue down to the level of the ventricles is by way of the AV node which takes that message and allows it to travel down this little piece of conduction system which is called the bundle of Hiss. This is the only one that penetrates that little connective tissue sheath and the only one that is uh, that communicates electrical information between the atria and the ventricles. All right so then the bundle of Hiss quickly bifurcates. It breaks into two and it is formed into the right bundle branch and left bundle branch. So the bundle branches are just smaller uh, uh, connect, uh, conduction system uh, material that is broken up from the bundle of Hiss. It breaks off into the right and left bundles and the left ventricle is simply so massive that it has to, uh, it requires even more breakdown of the bundle branch into something smaller so that it can target the entire tissue of the left ventricle and actually cause it to depolarize. So we have a further breakdown here of an anterior fascicle and a posterior fascicle. So you'll see this as the left anterior fascicle and a fascicle is nothing more than a fancy term for saying a bundle but since bundle was already used here and this is smaller we're gonna call it a fascicle and this guy here is the left posterior fascicle and these guys are simply responsible for making sure that the front and the back portion of the left ventricle since it's so massive actually receive the message that it's time to depolarize and contract so We've talked about a lot of stuff here. We got to add a few more components. We talked about inherent firing rate of the SA node. We talked about inherent firing rate of the AV junction. Remember that the AV node has no pacemaking capability. It's the AV junction, the area around the AV node that has this property called automaticity that you read about. And that inherent firing rate of the AV junction is 40 to 60 beats per minute. That's a really, really critically important concept. All right, last but not least, when we get to the level of the bundle branches and ventricular tissue, it too has a firing rate, and that firing rate is 20 to 40 times per minute or less. The lower you get down here, the lower you get, the closer to the feet that you get, the lower the inherent firing rate. So down here it might be in the tens, uh, the teens, or the single units. 
So you'll see that there's no competition here. SA node is the clear primary pacemaker because of the rate. If it fails and that rate falls below 60, then the AV junction picks up. If the AV junction and the SA node die, then we get really, really, really slow responses out of the ventricles at rates of 20 to 40. And then eventually we get these really, really, really slow rates of in the teens when it's purely ventricular tissue that's, uh, that's creating that depolarization. Usually this is not something that sustains life for very long all right, and requires some pretty aggressive intervention. All right, so what do you need to know about all this? You need to know all the names of the different components of the, of the conduction system. You need to know the inherent firing rates. You need to know where each piece of the conduction system is located and which components of the heart, which chambers, each is responsible for uh, triggering depolarization and then muscle contraction. All right, so we'll talk a little bit more about this in the following video, and let's take a break for now.